This course will cover Maxim Secure Authentication. During this training session today, we will be discussing why companies need authentication to protect their IP and prevent unauthorized access in the authentication introduction. We will then discuss the two types of crypto algorithms used in authentication systems. An asymmetric algorithm called ECDSA, which is an acronym for Elliptical Curve Digital Signature Algorithm, and a symmetric algorithm called SHA-256, which is an acronym for Secure Hash Algorithm. The SHA-256 uses 256 bits in its computational methodology. Some of the applications using these devices are also shown in this session. Why do we need authentication? Products have been cloned for decades. Some are harmless, like the fake watches on the right. When a customer buys a cloned watch, this reduces the revenue of the OEM manufacturer. The product is typically low cost and of poor quality. Some other clones are dangerous. An example of this is a fake battery in a cell phone. The battery may not be compatible with the charging circuitry within the phone. The battery could catch fire, causing injury and creating a liability for the OEM manufacturer. Listed here are examples of issues that could be averted by using authentication in the solution. Why energy grids are so susceptible to cyber attacks? Small microcontrollers are used to automate power plants and the electric grid, from coal to nuclear to natural gas to wind turbines and other renewables. The attacker just needs to launch a worm targeted at a specific controller to cause disruption to normal operation. Another example of this type of attack happened in Iran, where a worm named Stuxnet caused the destruction of up to 5,000 Iranian centrifuge enrichment devices. Stuxnet made the PLCs run at an unsafe speed while telling the operator that all was well. A second worm called Flame trolling through Iranian computers sent back critical information on military and scientific secrets. A worm similar to Flame could be embedded into Chinese counterfeit routers, allowing these routers to transmit military and scientific secrets if installed in government offices. More and more products include wireless interfaces and controls, making them also vulnerable to hacking. The Insulin Pump Vulnerable to Hacking article explains how Jay Radcliffe was able to hack and control an insulin pump to inject its entire contents wirelessly. This type of attack can be done on pacemakers, operating room monitors, and surgical instruments. Authentication is to prevent these types of attack. How do we authenticate goods? There are many ways to authenticate products. In this slide, for example, if we want to authenticate the printer cartridge, we can have the cartridge send out the known password to the printer before the printing can move on. This is a weak authentication. Since the person in the middle could catch the password during the transmission, and reuse it for the fake ones. To avoid that problem, a better way to authenticate is that the cartridge could prove it knows a secret without disclosing it. This method is called challenge response authentication. There are two fundamentally different authentication schemes. Symmetric systems, which rely on secret keys shared by host and authenticator, and asymmetric systems, such as the Elliptic Curve Digital Signature Algorithm, ECDSA, which rely on a private key in the authenticator and a public key that the host uses to verify the authenticator. In open systems where third-party entities need to be authenticated, the management and protection of the secret keys can be a problem. Here is where ECDSA offers the required flexibility. This picture illustrates how ECDSA works. 
Alice generates both public and private keys. She sends the public key to Bob, fully aware that Eve will try to intercept it. When Alice sends a message to Bob, she uses her private key to sign the message, incorporating Bob's public key. The third person, in this example Eve, can intercept the data but cannot modify it without Alice's private key or read it without Bob's private key. With the ECDSA method, the public key is used for verifying and the private key is not sent out, so it's not compromised along the way. Fundamentally, the private key is used by the originator to sign a message. The recipient uses their key to validate the signature. This is a typical application of ECDSA authentication. The DS28E35 is our asymmetric ECDSA authenticator, which can be embedded into peripherals, sensors, consumables, etc. The DS2475 is the companion coprocessor for a microcontroller that is communicating with the DS28E35. With this public key ECDSA implementation, users can be worry-free regarding host site attacks. The DS2475 is the low-cost coprocessor companion for authentication of DS28E35 peripherals. It offloads ECDSA host processing while using the integrated I2C to one-wire bridge. The DS2475 has a low power sleep mode and has no EEPROM on board, so there's no need to pre-program. The DS28E35 provides a highly secure solution based on the industry standard FIPS 186 ECDSA. The ECDSA engine computes keys and signatures using a pseudo-random curve over a prime field according to the Standards for Efficient Cryptography, SEC. The private and public key can be computed by the device or installed by the user and optionally locked. Separate memory space is set aside to store and lock a public key certificate as it is needed to verify authenticity. Here is an example of authentication between a server and a network connected subsystem. The benefits this configuration provide are easy key distribution to the customer, don't need security for public key on their server, authenticated device to a cloud-based server, don't worry about the one-wire protocol. Another crypto algorithm type uses a symmetric key instead of an asymmetric key like ECDSA. In such systems, authentication happens when they validate the device identity and show that it belongs to a host system. This is how it works. First, the host asks a unique question called a challenge. Second, the host receives a unique answer called response from the device. Third, the host validates the response and authenticates or rejects the device. As an example, let's take a look at how a pulse oximeter implements authentication. This will be the same for any application. The pulse oximeter system has two parts, a host instrument and a finger sensor. The host system has two components, a microcontroller or FPGA and an authenticator coprocessor. The finger sensor is plugged into the host instrument, which initiates the authentication process. First, the micro or FPGA generates a random number and then sends it to the authenticator within the finger sensor. This is the challenge or unique question. The authenticator then takes that random number, 
combines it with a secret key and other data, then uses the Authenticator SHA-256 engine and produces a MAC, Message Authentication Code, or response. This is also known as a message digest. The host microcontroller or FPGA saves the response as the device response. The host microcontroller or FPGA then sends the same random number or challenge to the coprocessor within the host system. The coprocessor takes that random number, combines it with a secret key and other data. Then it generates a MAC using its SHA-256 engine. The host microcontroller, or FPGA, compares the host response with the device response. If these match, the device is authentic. If not, the device is disabled. It's easy to make the connection between a random number as a unique question, but how do you generate a unique answer using SHA-256? The SHA-256 function takes and distills the message to produce a MAC, Message Authentication Code, or Message Digest. The MAC is a digital fingerprint of the original message, making it a unique answer to a unique question. To be a secure hash algorithm, SHA needs to have the following attributes. First, non-reversible. Data loss is a part of SHA-256 message processing. This attribute ensures that given a MAC, it's not possible to generate the original message. Second, the avalanche effect. If one bit was changed in the message, the MAC output changes drastically. This prevents hackers from incrementally feeding in message digests to make a correlation with the MAC. Third, collision resistant. It's mathematically impossible to have two messages with the same MAC and have it make sense. This is a typical application using SHA-256 authentication. This is a SHA-256 authenticator with protected EEPROM. It features a FIPS 180 SHA-256 engine with one wire interface and is available with different EEPROM sizes. This is the authenticator with coprocessor and one wire master. In summary, there are two types of crypto algorithm, the symmetric key and the asymmetric key. In an ECDSA system, the host operates with the public key and the slave device operates with a corresponding private key. The private key must be protected, while the public key does not need protection. In symmetric key types, such as SHA-256, the host and slave operate from the same secret key, and the secret must be protected from disclosure attack on both sides. The symmetric key has lower algorithm complexity, thus shorter computation time, in comparison to the asymmetric one. Listed here are application examples that use Maxim authentication ICs. In a pulse oximeter, our authentication IC is used to ensure the sensor is only used once. Our device also calibrates the LED sensor to enable a more accurate reading. Counterfeit wine has been a problem for high-end winemakers for many years. To combat the counterfeit wine, Winemakers are deploying Maxim's NFC, Near Field Communication, authenticators. Because these are wireless devices, they can be embedded anywhere on products without electronics. Computing peripherals use authentication to ensure cables and accessories are OEM approved. Shown here on the cable is our authenticator IC in an SFN package. The classic example of authentication is a consumer model called the Razor and Razor Blade model. Manufacturers would sell their base unit, a printer in this case, at a discounted price and generate revenue selling ink. This too is made possible with authentication. With the growth of the IoT, 
Internet of Things, where machine-to-machine -machine communication dominates, authentication plays an important role in making sure each device is authentic to the IoT system. Network servers and equipment have an exponential growth and complexity, with more RAID cards and network nodes. Authentication is used to ensure components of the servers are approved by the OEM, and when a fault has occurred, for example a damaged RAID card within a server, it can be quickly identified. Batteries are another area that use authentication. Lithium batteries use fast charging algorithms that require strict battery specifications. Having an authenticator ensures the battery's compatibility with the device, for example this camera. Third-party FPGA software developers generate royalties for their designs. To ensure that the bitstream loaded isn't copied, these companies deploy authentication to prevent cloning and manage royalty revenue. To summarize, this training session introduces secure authentication, two types of crypto algorithms, and some of the applications which use authentication for protection. For more information on this topic, please go to our website at www.maximintegrated.com under Products, Embedded Security, and Secure Authenticators. Thank you for watching this and see you again in another educational video of Maxim Integrated.